morning, church. Uh, glad to be with you again today. Um, thanks again for letting me record one, one once more. We are uh, just, you know, a few weeks away from softball being done, and and uh, we won't be traveling so much. We'll be here uh, with you again, and, and we look forward to that very soon. Um, we've been studying the book of Daniel. We're in chapter 9. I'm very excited about this morning's um, lesson. It's it's uh, fa- fairly complicated because this prophecy is so exact, but I think if you'll hang with me, you'll understand the uh, message that God is sharing through the angel Gabriel to the prophet Daniel. Now, the scene is very simple. It's likely three o'clock in the afternoon that Daniel is praying, uh, facing towards Jerusalem, which is his custom. It's what he's used to doing. We know he's a man of prayer. We know that uh, he was such a man of prayer that it got him thrown into the, into the lion's den. So uh, Daniel is consistent in his prayer life. He is proper in how he addresses God. His character as a person is unmatched. And so we think about what does it take to be the type of person that God would send a personal message to. A person like Daniel. You know, it would be awesome to have our prayers answered uh, in an audible fashion from God. That doesn't usually happen. We see our prayers uh, play out before our eyes. We see direction from prayer and scripture. We have the Holy Spirit that guides us. Daniel Daniel did not have the Holy Spirit dwelling in him like we do. So um, this prophecy is so exact, and it explains so much about our history, and particularly in this case, the history of the nation of Israel and what's going to happen to that nation. And God wants Daniel to write this down. He wants Daniel to pay attention. So he dispatches his number one messenger, the angel Gabriel. And I don't want to get too far ahead of myself in this, but I just want you to know that uh, this has been researched uh, well by two individuals in history. Um, John MacArthur helped. Uh, me understand this prophecy like none other, and I'm so appreciative of the Grace to You Ministries. Um, but I think if you follow along, I'll get it explained, and and uh, the rest of this chapter will make sense to you. Uh, Daniel, again, he's been praying. He's been confessing his sins. Uh, he's been confessing the sins of the nation Israel. They've been uh, in captivity Um, For almost 70 years, and Daniel knows this, and as you remember, he's been reading from the prophet Jeremiah, and the prophet Jeremiah uh, explained that God would carry uh, Judah away for a period of 70 years. And Daniel was likely part of that first deportation around 605 B.C., and he knows it's got to be close to 70 years. And so he's praying for God to do what he said he would do and to restore the, the nation of Israel, uh, particularly Judah and Benjamin at this point, uh, restore them and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And, and I want you to remember that that's a very distinct part of Daniel's prayer, and that's a distinct part of this prophecy and its fulfillment. So we're going to pick up at verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9. And this is uh, this section is entitled the seventy weeks. Uh, your Bible, if you read the King James, may say weeks of years, and it's a, a Jewish phrase to represent seventy times seven. And so we should understand that this period of time, first of all, that Daniel's talking about, is a period of four hundred and ninety years. That's what Gabriel is explaining to Daniel. So let's just let's just read through, and, and I'll kind of explain as we go. Starting in verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression. That's the first reason for the 70 weeks. To put an end to sin, the second. 
and to atone for iniquity. You may say sin and iniquity are two different things, but they're not. Uh, to finish the transgression means to let it play clear out. To put an end to sin would be to put an end to sin in general. And uh, the idea of sin ruling. And then to atone for iniquity. And we can only understand that uh, in, the, in the cross of Christ when he comes uh, and brings the perfect atonement for our sin. He is the propitiation for our sin. He is the ransom uh, price that is due for our sin. And Jesus could pay that price because he was sinless. He was the God-man. He was perfect. And, and his uh, ledger note, if you will, his credit has been applied to us because he didn't owe a death. He paid for our death with his own. And so the third thing is to atone for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to both seal vision and profit, and to anoint the most holy place. So the cross, cross ushers in everlasting righteousness. It's now possible. It will happen. The canon, the Old Testament canon and the New Testament canon have been complete. So both vision and prophecy have ceased and to anoint the most holy place. And that's the end when Jesus will come and uh, take the throne in Jerusalem and establish the everlasting kingdom. Now, some say that's after the millennial kingdom, and that's fine, and, and I'm fine with that. So we have the millennial kingdom when Jesus comes, a thousand-year reign, and then an everlasting kingdom where we will dwell with him in the most holy place where the Bible tells us God himself will instruct us. You won't have to depend on me for any instruction. Praise the Lord. Thank God, right? Um, no, God himself will instruct us from the most holy place. So Gabriel has been dispatched to Daniel um, from heaven. That's a mighty long journey for a mortal, but da uh, Gabriel is an angel and he comes quickly. While Daniel was still speaking and praying to God. So, Gabriel says, Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the world to restore and, or the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. All right, let's look at that just a little bit. The going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Um, some people have misunderstood this and say that uh, what's happening here is the decree of Darius or Cyrus. Uh, many people, most people think that they're the same, same person, that Cyrus has the title of Darius. But that Cyrus, Darius issues a decree to send the Jews back from Babylon. And, and that's not um, what this is saying. This has nothing with rebuilding Jerusalem, uh, the first decree allowed the Jews to go back and rebuild the temple. And you can read about that in Ezra. And they have a lot of trouble with that. Uh, as a matter of fact, the trouble that they have is because they don't have a permit to be re rebuilding the city. Oh, they were just there to rebuild the temple. Well, later on, we find that Artaxerxes is reigning and Nehemiah is sorrowful. He's attending Artaxerxes at his throne, and Artaxerxes asks Nehemiah what's the matter, and he tells him, you know, how long it's been uh, for the holy city of God. And so uh, Artaxerxes approves of Nehemiah, uh, approves to Nehemiah in chapters 1 and 2 of Nehemiah that they would be allowed to go back and rebuild the walls and rebuild the streets and that period took 49 years, or seven weeks, rebuilding of Jerusalem, Nehemiah chapter 1 and 2. So there shall be seven weeks. That's the seven weeks that Gabriel is talking about. Then for 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, the anointed one shall be cut off, and shall have nothing. 
So who's the anointed one? Who's the prince? Well, we know that person is Jesus. And Jesus, when he died, was cut off. That literally means to be killed. That literally means to be executed as a criminal. So we can understand that if the Jews just read Daniel, they'll understand that Messiah was going to die. And so it shouldn't, the cross shouldn't be a stumbling block for them because the prophet Daniel says that he would be executed. So this period of 62 weeks is from Jerusalem being rebuilt from Nehemiah all the way to our records in the New Testament of Hosanna, Hosanna, the King of David, the Messiah, the Meshiach Nagi. That is the term in Hebrew for the prince that would come, the Messiah prince. This is a regal title that Jesus has, the anointed one, the Meshiach Nagi. And he shall be cut off and have nothing. So he's executed and has nothing. Why does he have nothing? Because he didn't come to gain power. He didn't come to conquest lands. He didn't come to rule over people. He came to become the atoning sacrifice for transgression, for our transgression. And so this time of 62 weeks is the time that it takes for Jerusalem to be rebuilt, Palm Sunday. So we have here a total of uh, 69 weeks or 483 years. And all the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and its sanctuary. Now this prince and all the people signifies Antichrist and Rome. Um, the people uh, of Antichrist start uh, opposing Christ from the very beginning. Uh, and these people are the Roman soldiers. They come in in 70 AD. They destroy the temple. It says, its end shall come with the flood, and there shall be desolations, or there shall be war, and desolations are decreed. So there's been war after war after war after war throughout history against the Jews. Um, it's just an amazing thing that of all the people groups in the Bible that were so awesome and great, only the Jews have remained and survived. But we should, shouldn't mistake that or think that's a coincidence. God said he would never forsake his people, and he's always had a plan to restore them. And so... Um, when the Romans came in in 70 AD, they absolutely massacred people. Um, they would crucify as many as 500 a day. They walled in the city and wouldn't allow any food or out and literally starve those that had survived to death. Uh, Josephus writes about it. People became so hungry that they ate shoe leather. Um, they ate their belts. They ate their clothing. And yeah, they ate their children. Um, if that's not uh, desolation, I don't know what is. But it, it goes forward in time now, Daniel does, and he says, and he, that being that prince, that Antichrist, will make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half a week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. So many for a week and for half a week, we're talking about a period of three and a half years here. And we know in Revelation that the first three and a half years, Antichrist uh, establishes a peace with the Jews, some sort of treaty. He allows them to continue in worship. He allows the apostate church to continue in worship. But at three and a half years, he cuts that off. He puts a stop to it. And he goes in and abominates the temple with an idol. That idol is himself. He desecrates it. He desecrates the temple and establishes himself as God. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Hmm. When would that be? That would be when Jesus comes back and establishes his holy 
everlasting temple. Now, we went through that pretty fast, so I just want to talk a little bit about Jerusalem being rebuilt to Palm Sunday. Again, it was when Artaxerxes gave the decree that uh, to Nehemiah that he should go back and have all the materials, have everything needed to rebuild the city. And it took a long time, troubled times. Uh, Nehemiah, you'll read through that book and you'll find that they had to work during the day and then be in the trenches with a sword ready to fight at night. They had all kinds of opposition. So it took a long time to rebuild the city. And then we, we have this history of apostasy from the Jews just over and over and over. Um, they, they're not obedient to God. Uh, and one of the things that they're most flag, flagrant about, and this is where this idea of 70 weeks of years comes in, is they're flagrant about observing the Sabbath and the Sabbath year, um, and then the, the year of Jubilee. Um, the Sabbath year was every seventh year, and every seventh year the Jews were supposed to let the land rest. They could, they could plant and harvest as hard as they wanted for six years, but at the seventh year they were supposed to let the land rest, and then they could continue. Well, what happens is, uh, you know how man is, he gets greedy. And they did get greedy, and they started skipping the Sabbaths. How many did they skip? They skipped 49. And so God gives them 490 years uh, worth of penalty to uh, take care of them missing all those Sabbaths. And the year of Jubilee was the 49th year of those Sabbaths. Every seven Sabbaths, they had a year of Jubilee, every 49th year. And at that time, the lands would go back to the original uh, family owners. Slaves would be freed. Debts would be forgiven. That's how their economic system worked. Well, of course, they got to skip in that too. So, so God, for that reason and many other reasons, has them carried away into Babylon. And this is the time that Daniel's living in. He's uh, toward the end of that um, 70 years that, that God was going to make them in, uh, be in exile. And, so, oh, you know, I said that wrong. The, the Jews had been punished for 70 years because of the 70 Sabbaths that they had skipped. And so that they're getting one year for every year. So, so God is going to keep his Sabbath year, whether the Jews want to or not. He's going to take them away from the land so it can rest on its own. Let's continue here um, with this prophecy. Um, we, we've come to the end of it in our scripture that the decree being poured out on the desolator, and, and the desecrator is Antichrist. He establishes his uh, temporary kingdom for seven years. We've, we've already discussed that and read about that in Daniel chapter 7 and 8. He's the little horn. Um, the New Testament refers to him as the man of sin or the man of lawlessness, the man of perdition. Um, and he will come to an end and be destroyed, not by human power, but divine power and the holy everlasting temple will be established where God himself will instruct us. Now, let's take a look at some math here. So, on March 14th, 445 B.C., that's when the decree of Artaxerxes came from Nehemiah. that You can read about in Nehemiah chapter 1 and 2. Now, you take 483 years, which is 7 plus 63, okay, and, and you multiply that out. We have 483 years, you add one week to that, you have 490, which is what we're talking about, 7 times 70 years, 490 years total. So we're going to take off this last week because this is when the Antichrist comes, and it's from the cross of Jesus to the Antichrist, the holy everlasting temple. And, and nobody knows how long that last week will last. Um, we just don't know. That's only for God to know. Jesus himself said so. But we do know about 483 years. And you take that times 360, and you have 100 
73,880 days when you take into account leap year. Um, and you have to understand that this 360 days is the biblical standard calendar. 30 days a month. 30 days times 12 is 360. And how did they account for the five days that, that the Gentile calendar used? Well, they threw in an extra month every once in a while to make up for it. That's just how they did it, uh, to, to make up for the solar uh, schedule and solar calendar. But if we take this prophecy of 483 years times 360 days of the Jewish calendar, we come up with, 173,880 days. A lot of days, right? <clears throat> March 14th, 4, 445 BC is when Artaxerxes gave the permission for Nehemiah to go back and rebuild his temple. It's a, the exact date in scripture. You can look it up and see the, the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes um, history is very clear about when that was in 445 B.C. And Nehemiah gives us the 14th day of that month of March. And you extend that all the way to April 6, 32 A.D. And guess what you have? 173,880 days. Palm Sunday. God is exact. We should have no doubt. God is exact. We have examples of his exactness even in, in the flood. Um, it's described as five months. It's described as 150 days. How long is that? 150 days divided by 30 is five months. Mm. We have the tribulation described in the exact number of days, um, three and a half years, 42 months, plus 42 months, seven years. God is very exact. And I know it's a lot to grasp, but to think that <laughs> all those centuries before Jesus came, the prophet Daniel gave an exact prophecy of 173,880 days that was completely and utterly fulfilled from March 14, 445 BC to April 6, 32 AD. When the people, and, and this is an accurate date, by the way, Passover, that year. Okay, that's likely Palm Sunday. Go back to Jewish records. On Sabbaths, Jesus uh, was proclaimed the King of Kings by his own people. I think it's an incredible prophecy. And I think we should be confident in knowing that that's how God deals with us, with exactness. And he doesn't want us to misunderstand things. He doesn't want us to question things. He wants us to be confident in history unfolding the way he says it will. Now, we don't know about this last week. All we know is he's coming and he will be defeated by our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we will be in the presence of God being instructed by him personally. It's, a, it's truly an awesome prophecy. Um, we're going to learn more about uh, some of these events as we continue on in Daniel. But this is the broad overview of uh, when Daniel received the vision, um, explaining history of his people. And up until that point, all the prophecies he had got pertain to the Gentiles. Now... He has something to understand for his own people. And that, that's got to be an incredible feeling to know that you're a type of person that God will give you the kind of information you need to deal with your own circumstances in your own life and know a way forward. 
guess what? He's done that for each one of us. Folks, we, we have no excuse to not be confident in our faith. It's all right here. Everything has happened as God said it would. The more archaeologic archaeologists dig, the more true God's word becomes and the more confident we can have. There's never been anything dug up to discredit God's word. Everything that's dug up <laughs> only points to the truth of God's word. So have confidence in this prophecy. Have confidence in in the prophet Daniel and what he has told us and help us understand that we don't have to be scared. The king is coming. The king is coming. What's the worst that can happen to any of us? We die. We lose loved ones that, that, that die. Well, let's make it our mission not to lose a loved one for any longer than just this mere mortal life. Uh, folks, you probably have a friend, a relative that you care deeply about that doesn't know Jesus. I want you to prepare yourself this week in prayer and God's reading. And I, I want you to ask specifically for guidance from God, for courage from God, to God giving you words to share with that person so that you might share your faith with them, give them your personal testimony, and tell them about Jesus so that they might have the same kind of confidence that you and I have. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning and this great prophecy from Daniel. And, and Father, I, I'm so thankful that you've given me the ability to understand it after studying it all week. I I was quite lost at the beginning and, and Father, it's just uh, so amazing that your that your word is so exact and that we can look upon it, be confident about it, research it, find out uh, the truth behind it and the truth that it represents going forward. Father, I thank you so much for all the saints that are here this morning, all the saints that will be watching. I just pray, Father, that this has made sense to them and that they would have peace and confidence in knowing that you spoke directly to uh, Daniel and sent Gabe, Gabriel to explain your message. Uh, Father, we have uh, many praises to give you. Um, I want to thank you so much for the healing that has occurred in, in the son of uh, Bridget and Cody Quint. Um, what, a, what a blessing that is. Uh, to know that they they finally had uh, an answer and a solution uh, to, to get him healed up and to get him brought home. Father, we're thankful for a community like this that we live where uh, a young family like that can be supported and, and can be helped and succeed even in the uh, direst of circumstances. Father, we thank you for all of those that have gone before us that have uh, helped establish our faith. We thank you, Father, for the men and women throughout uh, the world that are serving this country and our forces. Father, we just pray for peace for them and, and comfort for them. Um, give them the strength and the courage they need to do their job. And Father, strengthen us as we go forward from this place, as we uh, partake in communion together, that we might share our hearts with you and be reminded of all that Jesus has done for us, but especially that saving work that was accomplished on the cross because of his perfect life and your perfect will. It's in Jesus' name we pray.